Let's all stand and worship the Lord together.
All my days have been held in your hand From the moment that I wake up Till I lay my head I will sing of the goodness of God All my life you have been faithful All my life you have been so, so good With every breath that I am able I will sing of the goodness of God I love your voice you have led me through the fire in darkest night. You are close like no other. I've known you as a father. I've known you as a friend. I have lived in the goodness of God. So my life you have been. All my life you have been so, so good With every breath that I am able I will sing of the goodness of God Your goodness is running after, it's running after me Your goodness is running after, it's running after me with my life laid down, I surrender now. I give you everything. Your goodness is running after, it's running after me. So my life, you have been faithful. Oh my life, you have been so. the goodness of God, and I will sing of the goodness of God, I will sing of the goodness of God. Yes, Lord Jesus, we thank you. God, we want to praise you now, Jesus. Thank you, God. Thank you, Lord. We love you, God.
his favor be upon you in a thousand generations. Your family, your children, and your children, and your children. May his favor be upon you in a thousand generations. And your family, and your children, and your children, and your children. May his presence go before you and behind you. Beside you, all around you, and within you, he is with you, he is with you in the morning, in the evening, in your coming, and your going, in your weeping, and rejoicing, he is for you, 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 he is for you. worship you now, God, as we sing these songs, Lord Jesus. It's not just lip service, Lord. It's not just lip service, God. We are crying out to you, Lord, from the depths of our spirits, Lord, in truth, God, in spirit, Lord. We want to see you made great in this place, Lord Jesus. to see you high and lifted up in this place, Lord Jesus. It's not about us, Lord. This isn't about entertainment, Lord. This isn't about sounding good so your neighbor isn't annoyed, Lord. This is about worship, God. We love you, Lord Jesus. We praise you, Lord. It's in your precious name.
your children now. You are the same God. You are the same God. You answer prayers back then, and you will answer now. You are the same God. You are the same God. You were providing then. You are providing now. You are the same God. You are the same God. You moved in power then. God moved in power now. You are the same God. You are the same God. You were a healer then. You are a our prayer, Lord, that we would stand, God, on your faithfulness, Lord Jesus, that it wouldn't be about us, God, and the things that we can do, God, and the things that we have to offer, Lord Jesus, because we know, God, that all of our righteousness is as filthy rags. We know, God, that we don't have what it takes, Lord, unless your spirit dwells within us. God, Move mightily amongst your people now, Lord, as we open your word, God. As we continue to worship, Lord, through the power of the scriptures poured into our hearts, Lord. God, your spirit does it. Your Holy Spirit teaches, God. Let us who have ears hear, God. We love you. We praise you. We want to worship you even now, Lord, continually worshiping our Savior. It's in your precious name. Amen. Well, this morning, we are in the book of Acts as we make our way through, and I purposely want to take the time to focus on these seven verses, that is two, verses 40 through 47. To move through these would be a mistake too fast. Next week, we're going to cover chapter 3 completely, where Peter will heal, la heal this lame man who had been lame, uh, had been paralyzed and lame since birth. He'll heal him. It'll cause some ruckus in the temple, and, uh, and he'll be back to preaching again, and more people getting saved. So next week's going to be great. But here we are. The title of the message is, The Church Grows. The church grows. There's been a lot of reasons why uh, uh, people attribute church growth. They, they go after a lot of different things to, to grow the church. I mean, you know, we're called to go, go make disciples. And, and I will say this, to adjust our thinking a little bit, we're not called to make church goers. And this isn't just about being saved. This is about becoming disciples, followers of Jesus Christ. The church is to be hot on the heels of the Savior. 
And, and so uh, today we live in a culture uh, that uh, uses all kinds of goofy things to put people in the seats, that they might hear some little thing that might stir them up uh, to trust God in some way. Um, and so we've dumbed down the important stuff and, uh, and made all the unimportant stuff the draw. And it's been said, what you draw them with is what you draw them to. What you draw them with is what you draw them to. So if we're drawing you by the Spirit of God to the Word of God and to worship God and to be a disciple of Christ, that's the draw, then that's what you'll become. We want to be careful that the church grows. And so here we have four pillars or four basic principles of the Christian faith here in our, our passage this morning. It, Acts 2.42 is a model verse. They were steadfast. The earliest church, not the early, the earliest church was steadfast in the apostles' doctrine. That is the, the apostles' teaching, the breaking of bread, communion, fellowship, that word koinonia we'll talk some more about, and prayer, and prayer. The church grew rapidly from the start because of these four basic principles. And to remove from these four basic principles is a huge mistake, not just corporately, but personally in your life. As a disciple, these are the things that you build your life upon, these things here. When you're looking to worship God in spirit and truth, this is what it looks like. To be a follower of Christ, this is what it looks like. So... This week, Denise and I were blessed. We were able to, to go to the Calvary Chapel uh, International Pastors Conference down in, in, uh, in Diamond Bar at Calvary Chapel. Um, there were uh, Pastor Raul Reese, go, Pastor, uh, Calvary Chapel Golden Springs, and uh, it were Pastor Raul Reese, one of the first generation pastors of, of uh, the movement of Calvary Chapel. Um, and, and so we had some of, the, some of the greats. I mean, you know, and, and it's amazing. Uh, now, I've been in the 34 years, I've been a part of Calvary Chapel, and, and to see these guys go, they look so young in their, you know, late 40s or early to mid 50s, and, and now, you know, they're, they're like late 70s, Mike McIntosh, I think, is 80 or 81, and to see these guys still preaching the word, and still leading by example, and still holding to the values that we find right here in this chapter, it, it's, it's what what makes me want to continue here being a part of this, all right? This is super important. They're doing the same thing they were doing, they're doing today they did 40, 50 years ago because it's truth. It's what brings transformation. It's what brings salvation. It's what makes disciples. And so we're part of a movement that is, that is still moving to, to see uh, there are over 1,500 at this conference, and, and young men and women, as well as, as, well as you know, as little pastors and leaders conference. So there was, there was young gals there, young guys, young people plugging in, coming from the Bible colleges, like Troy West is out at CBI, Calvary Bible Institute, we have right now. But, but to see the fire and the desire in these young people, as, as well as guys that have been fighting the good fight for 40, 50 years, preaching behind their pulpits. I'm, I was just honored really, to, to just be there and participate. And, and many of these principles that we're looking at today were just reinforced, reestablished, reaffirmed at the conference. What, I, I didn't come back and, and learn some new trick to draw people to the church. That's not what we learn at these conferences, at least these conferences. Sometimes I think that's what people think. But what I see here is the model of Calvary Chapel established here in these seven verses. And how important that is. It's the, it's the blueprint. Again, it's the model for ministry and to live your life as a child of God. Let's go ahead and read chapter two of Acts, picking up in verse 40. And with many other words, he, that is Peter, testified and exhorted them, saying, be saved from this perverse generation. And then those who gladly received his word were then baptized. And that day, about 3,000 souls were added to them. Added, souls were added 
to the disciples. We had 120 there in that upper room, there at the temple. Again, it's not the upper room where Jesus had the last supper with his, it's not the same place, different place. This is a, a room there at the, on the temple mount. And there's 120 waiting. The spirit of God comes upon or falls upon this 120. Peter stands up and preaches. And 3,000 souls are added as disciples. Not just, hey, we, we, they got saved. Praise God they got saved. They got saved and now they're disciples is what the scripture is telling us now. So we're going to move forward. Added to them in verse 42. And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship, in the breaking of bread and in prayers. And then fear came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were done through the apostles. Now all who believed were together and had all things in common, and sold their possessions and goods and divided them among all as anyone had need. So continuing daily with one accord in the temple and breaking bread from house to house, they ate their food with gladness and simplicity of heart, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to the church daily those who were being saved. What a beautiful sight. Something that was reoccurring on a daily basis People are getting saved because, listen, these disciples, these newfound believers in Christ were living their life on a daily basis for Christ. Therefore, on a daily basis, there were those added to the church by the Lord's doing. Their life was a testimony. They were hot on the heels of a resurrected Savior. It's beautiful. And so it begins here in verse 40. This is kind of where we left off last week. And with many other words, Peter, Peter, it, it just, we just, it, the sermon was so much more than what we just read or what we read last week. Peter, he said, with other words, with many other words, Peter here testified, gave testimony. Remember, these are apostles. They had been with Jesus they had ate with him and slept with him and walked with him and heard him and saw him heal. And, and, and then not only that, they, their testimony was, he is risen. Don't, if we go back to Acts 1, when they were going to choose somebody to replace Judas, remember the requirement. They chose someone who had been with them and with the Lord and was an eyewitness of his resurrection. And so there was much to his testimony and there's a lot to your testimony. As a disciple of Christ, there, you have a testimony. And we're to use that testimony to exhort, to encourage, to spur people on, to want to know Christ and live for Christ and, and to be disciples. The best evangelist is one who has a testimony and is set out to exhort those around him. Let me tell you about my Jesus. Let me tell you how God came through. Let me tell you what he did yesterday. He showed up here. He showed up there. Then he did this. It was crazy. And this is how I'm growing. And this is what I'm learning. Right? It's a testimony. It's all exhortive. And so Peter just continues to exhort them. And this is the message. Be saved from this perverse generation. I had taught last week as I, I ended here. This was a perverse generation indeed that cried out, crucify him, away with him, as he was like some worthless man, some criminal, some person, a murderer, just some worthless dog of a man. Away with him, get him out of my sight, put him on the cross. It was a, it was a, it was a bad, it was a corrupt, it was a perverted generation that would cry such a thing out. We live in a, a perverted generation today. As I said, right, millions of unborn babies and nobody, it, it rarely anybody turns a blind eye. Ah, you know, think about it. There's only a few people doing or saying anything about it. Right? That, should, that should change the course of your voting. Stand up. Say it's wrong. No way. Not on my clock. Watch, pray, reach out, do something, minister, exhort, give somebody a testimony, share Christ. 
We live in a perverse generation, a culture that is, in the current of that culture is speeding up, right? It's moving faster and faster in the days in which we live. And so, how powerful the message. How important it is to be disciples and followers of Christ because your testimony is brighter and louder now today than ever. If you and I will just stand up as Peter stood up and preached, be saved from this perverse generation. The perversities of this generation. You're being transformed. There's transformation happening here. My mind's being changed. They've repented. He, they've, he saw, that was been his message, repent, right? And be saved. I'm no longer going the way of the culture, a perverse culture. Doesn't matter your age. Doesn't matter your position or your stance within the culture. Just don't go the way of the culture swim against the culture. And then those who gladly received his word. I love this. Look, as children of God, you're going to have persecution. Jesus promised it. But at the same time, here's evidence, here's proof that even in a perverse generation, there will be those that listen. Those who have an ear to hear, they will hear your love for Christ. They will see your love for Christ. It will affect them. It says there were those who gladly received the word with gladness, with joy, with acceptance. Said, hey, that's true. That's resonating with me. And they were baptized. 3,000 souls. Now, this again is the day of Pentecost. And I don't think that it's ironic that it's also called the Feast of First Fruits. And indeed, 3,000 souls getting saved on this Pentecost was a special Pentecost. Truly, each one of these 3,000 were first fruits in the eyes of God. And every person since that have given their lives to Christ is a, is a display of God's first fruits among humanity. And this idea of them being baptized, it's not unto salvation. Don't even go there. I touched on it last week. If you weren't here, we'll go look at uh, last week's sermon. But their baptism was an instant, spontaneous display of their identification with Jesus, just like it is today. Now listen, this was a completely different baptism than that of John the Baptist. I mean, he was saying, hey, come, you know, for washing, cleansing. It was, a, it was a turning to Christ. It was a preparing, a baptism, preparing them to receive with gladness this message. He was a forerunner of the very sacrifice and work of Christ. But this is a whole new baptism. This is not like, this is a fulfillment of John's baptism. Baptized. Identifying with Christ. New converts. They're joyfully making this public statement of faith by being baptized after repenting of their sin. Peter's message was all about the gospel. That's what drew them. It's the good news. Now, what a large-scale baptism, you think. 3,000 baptisms. Get down. But did you know this summer... We had the largest, the largest baptism in U.S. history this last summer. That's right. Held at the historic baptism site of the 60s and 70s. Yes, the place where all the Jesus people met there in Pirate's Cove at Corona Del Mar in Southern California. This summer in one baptism, in one day, 4,166 people made public professions of faith and were baptized. God's moving. We can have the tendency to get so focused on what's all the bad and how God isn't moving. Listen, my friend, don't do that. 
Get your eyes on all that God is doing. God is moving. He's saving souls. Lives are being transformed. Yes, the current is speeding up, but the outpouring of the Spirit is too. Keep your eyes on what God's doing. Now you think, they're over on the Temple Mount. Water up by the Temple Mount? Listen, they had, during this time, on this day, there were multiple of pools and baths, right? In fact, the Pool of Siloam and, and, uh, and all of these things, right? They were right there. And so there was plenty of pools. So the, the whole crowd kind of separates and sort of takes over the city. And they start baptizing. Can you imagine the ruckus this caused up by the Temple Mount? <laughs> What's going on? Something new, right? What a day at Pentecost. It was new. The church is growing. And then, here's the application. It says in 42, they were saved, turning from a perverse generation. But this church, as it grew, it continued steadfastly. It continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine. This required them to be of the same mindset as they gathered in prayer and worship. They continued steadfastly. This is a problem in the church today, amongst Christians today. Disciples continue. You're hot on the hills of Jesus, and I'm not letting up. Now, I, I, I'm not boasting at all. But Denise and I were saved. This coming Easter will be 34 years ago. And, and, and I bet we haven't missed more than four Sundays in a row ever in those 34 years. We found a place to go. We went in many, many places. We went. We've experienced some pretty crazy stuff over the years, haven't we, baby? But we were in church, and our hearts were right. There has to be this, this decision that you need to make as a disciple of Christ that I'm going to continue steadfastly on the heels of my Savior. I'm following him. And as we see this whole message unfold, what we have is the earliest of church. They were, their, their whole lives encompassed the very gospel they surrendered their lives to. It didn't just become something I do on one day of the week. It became my life. My very life is changed, transformed. I'm going a completely new direction. And it's a one I take daily through this passage. They continue steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine or teaching, fellowship, breaking of bread, and in prayers. Now, many times the first thing that comes into the new believer's mind is, well, now what? What, what, what do I do now? Well, here is what's supposed to follow. The outpouring of the Spirit. These four basic functions of the early church and the early disciple of Jesus. The early church placed a high priority on the study and teaching of God's Word. All through the New Testament, one of the things you need to pick up as a learner is these apostles, they weren't just coming up with their own junk. Not only were they inspired by the Holy Spirit to write what we call the New Testament, but look how often they quote the Old and refer to the Old Testament. They weren't writing something just brand new. They were sticking to the doctrine, to God's word, and therefore God's word was coming forth. Sometimes pastors, you know, you're always looking for something fresh, something new. You know, I want to really catch the people off. God, I want to dazzle them. To, this Sunday, I'm going to dazzle them. And so I'm going to study and look for something new. Can I tell you a secret? It's not there. It's not there. There's fresh new ways to say it but it's said. There are fresh new ways to, to present that message to, to a culture, a generation, but it's the same message, man. I'm not looking to say something unique that somebody's never said before. Only a fool would do that. The apostles weren't doing that. They 
they placed a high priority in the study of God's word. We see this all through the book of Acts. And in order to make disciples of Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ must be taught. And we see that here in Peter's sermon in Acts 2. We'll see it again in Peter's sermon in Acts 3. We'll see it throughout the entire book of Acts. In fact, you see, there was, no, there, there, was, there was to be no departure from the apostles' teaching because it was founded on the truth of God. And today, we're moving away from that. Not us, but many are. Not just corporately as a church or churches, but even individuals. Secondly, it says that they were steadfast in fellowship. Now, many of you know that this Greek word is koinonia, is the Greek word. Beautiful word, right? And it's commonly used throughout the New Testament. But what you might not know is it's translated in a lot of different ways, just not fellowship. The word's used differently. In fact, <clears throat> in 2 Corinthians 6.14, the word is used as communion. It says, and so Paul is teaching the church in Corinth, what fellowship has righteousness and lawlessness? And what communion or fellowship, koinonia, has light with darkness? And in other places, the word fellowship, or should I say koinonia, is translated contribution, distribution, and sharing. And so as we can see, this word has a, has a deep personal meaning, right? It, it has to do with experiencing something that you can't experience by yourself. If you're in a car driving down the road, there's no chance you're going to experience koinonia because you're by yourself. Therefore, when the word says, where two or more are gathered in my name, I'm in the midst. Boy, you can expect Jesus to show up because there's this koinonia happening between, right, between you and I. It becomes like a Jesus party when there's more than just you. And so it's important to gather and not to neglect the gathering together because the early church clearly did not. The third is breaking of bread. This clearly speaks of communion. You know, Jesus in that upper room, he, he, he brought this institution to light that night of his arrest and said, hey, so this is this crack of this bread and this cup, it, it represents me and the sacrifice that I'll become. And so do this often and do it, and as you do it, do it in remembrance of me. And so, listen, this is what's beautiful. The earliest of church was walking in the strictest forms of obedience. They were, they were fulfilling exactly what Jesus told them to do. I wonder how Jesus looks at the, early, the church today and says, are, are, are they, is, my bride, is my bride corporately, are they really focused on just on being obedient? Right, like really just obeying. Well, they were obeying. Now, this also can speak at the same time of breaking a meal together. John Wolverd said this in his commentary, perhaps the breaking of bread included both the Lord's table and the sharing of a common meal. Because within our passage, within context, they are clearly doing life together. Both the spiritual side and the common and practical they're doing together. The fourth, and it's not fourth because it's the least of the list. Don't think that for a minute. The fourth is prayer. They were steadfast. They continued steadfastly in prayer. Prayer needs to, something, needs to be something that we do continually. Continually praying, right? Be praying. As we see in Acts 6, there arose a, a dispute amongst those who were not having their needs met. They were Hellenist widows, widows who, who weren't having their, their needs met. And, and so the, uh, the apostles get together and, and, uh, and this is, they elect some deacons to take care of that. Um, but in Acts 6, 4, it says this, and this is the mouth, these are the words of the apostles, but we will give ourselves continually to prayer and to the ministry of the word. And so here's two, two of the, probably the most powerful out of these four basic principles being exemplified by the apostles prioritizing these things in their life, right? 
It's important to meet needs. And we can get caught up in serving and doing ministry. And in this ministry, in this church, service is a big thing. I, I'm, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a, it's an upside down pyramid. I'm, I'm the chief servant, man. I'm, I'll clean a toilet, I'll lift a table, and, and there is a, just a group of men that are just servants, and women, servants. But you know, I never want to put that over my time in the Word and, and over prayer, and, and you shouldn't either. In fact, your service should be an extension. It should be birthed out of your time in the Word and out of your time in prayer. Who wants to listen to a worship team? I looked over at Josie and made eye contact. So this is spontaneous. Who wants to listen to the worship team or a worship team that hasn't been in prayer? The words aren't biblical. Again, it's just, it's secular music. It's what steps that are prayer. We pray. The words are biblical. It's worship. Okay? So, moving forward. This Acts 2.42 really is where we find the abiding legacy of God's work, of God's moving, of a movement of God. It's the legacy of the church. We're to continue steadfastly in the same mindset as we worship together. This is foundational. Now, what I see here in this chapter is, is the body taking care of itself. You know, a lot of times needs arise, right? And we're gonna talk about that in a second. But, but a lot of times people are like, well, you know, the church, you know, it doesn't meet my needs. I didn't get anything out of this, that whatever. They're all let down by church. But listen, what they never do is they never what we call plug in right? They don't show up on a continual basis or a consistent basis. They're not part of any kind of small group. They're not building relationships. They come in here. They don't want to make friends. You come in, I don't want to talk to anybody, and I want to leave. That is not this church. That is not this church. That's not this church. And if you're looking for one where you can slide in, slide out, and not talk to anybody, you can find one down the street, and you'll never grow in your faith. And your needs will be never be met. Needs, needs, they don't all come to my ear. I mean, it's impossible to have 400 people and for me to meet every need. It's not, and the apostles couldn't do it either in Acts 6. They're human, right? So this is the thing. When you become part of a fellowship and you're part of the church, your needs, they get expressed through relationship. And, and, and that's how the needs get met, spiritually, physically, emotionally, financially, whatever they might be. That's how it gets met. But, it, but if you're on the outside looking in, your needs are never going to get met. You're sitting here praying, God, pay my light bill, Lord. I, I need my light bill paid. And the Lord's saying, if you would get to church and be consistent, I've got this gal or this guy in Bible study that would be willing to meet that need, or the church, if it would be made known, to meet that need. But you're not here enough for anybody to know your need. You don't, you're not plugged in. That's not this church. That are, that's not these believers. Now, there's a contrast to the Acts 2.42 and what I just said. The contrast in the earliest of church really had their act together. But what's ironic is the Apostle Paul, if you go back and you read First and Second Corinthians, they were just the opposite. And we'd say that's the early church. Yeah, some 40-something years down the road. They're a mess, the church in Corinth. In his letters to the church in Corinth, they did not seem to have all things in common. In fact, Paul had to address all kinds of issues and problems that arose in their lifestyle in pursuit of God as believers, such as the abuse of the Lord's Supper. Spiritual gifts were a problem for them. There was divisions among them. There was immorality among them. 
There were those taking, suing and taking their brothers and sisters to court unlawfully. Their marriages were a mess and suffering. They clearly were not of the same mind. So it's real easy for a church or for a believer to just wander off the path. You know, I mean, each one of us, we need to hold to this, right? These four basic principles. I got to get this done. And as a pastor, it's super important. Verse 43, then fear came upon every soul and many wonders and signs were done through the apostles. Now look at the order of this. Now, you know, first fear is a great thing. Reverential, reverential awe, being in awe of God, right? I mean, and the church has lost the sense of awe of God. Why? Because it's not being preached. The authority and the power of God's word leads us in reverence and fear of God. If I teach this and I read this on a daily basis, I'll understand that God's a pretty awesome dude, that he's a pretty awesome God, and that there's judgment going to be coming someday, and I don't want to be part of it, right? There's something to be feared. There's a reverence we need to have for God. And, and the church in Corinth lost it altogether, for example. That's one of the things that led them down the wandering road they went, where Paul had to correct them. It's the same thing. And so when I hear a message about, um, and, 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 and I hear these different hot topics, right, that they, they, they touch on, they tickle your ears. But when you leave, do you leave with a sense of reverence for God? If you're hearing a message on marriage, for example, and, and, that, and you didn't leave with, 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 with a reverence for God as a, as a man who's supposed to love his wife as Christ loved the church and gave himself for it, or, or woman, you're supposed to respect your husband as unto the Lord, for this is your call and duty, Right? If you didn't, if you, you're not going to do that if you and I don't have reverence for God. If I didn't get some sense of reverence for God out of that, it's, I'm not going to find any motivation to do that. And so you got to see, this is what came out of Peter's preaching. Fear came upon every soul. With the knowledge of God and his grace comes reverence. A fear in the hearts of us. It, it, it keeps us like-minded. It keeps us together. Psalm 19.9, the fear of the Lord is clean. The fear of the Lord enduring forever. The judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. Many of you know Psalm 1.7, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and instruction. And so fear came upon, reverence for God fell upon everybody, and then guess what happened? <laughs> Signs and wonders were done. And people were like, what just happened? And I hate to say this, I'm not, I, don't, I don't focus on signs and wonders. They're sort of over here. But at the same time, I'm going to tell you right now, I need to see some signs and wonders. I'm not afraid to say that. I serve an awesome God. He's mighty to save, and he's heal, and he can restore. He can restore the marriage that's about broken, right, that's ready for trash, for a marriage ready for the dumpster. God can heal he could raise the dead. I mean, my God is mighty. Don't limit God. Where there's fear and reverence, God is not limited. And this church was not limited. They were a growing church. And again, the signs and wonders, this is evidence of the power of God. And where God is at work, lives are touched in a miraculous way. Whether it's 3,000 souls being saved or like in the very next chapter, Peter and John are just wandering off to the temple like they're supposed to do, just like this whole chapter 2 tells us that they're doing continually, steadfastly. And there's a lame guy, lame from birth, expecting to receive some alms. And Peter and John will say next week, silver and gold I don't have. But what I do have, here's my testimony, and here's my exhortation, just like from our passage. Peter will continue on. What I do have, I, I give to you in the name of Jesus. And he grabs that guy by the right hand, it says, and he, he stands up and walks. And guess what happened? They're up on the Temple Mount, and everybody's going, what just happened? Right? There's a crowd. <laughs> More people saved. Because they see this guy that they'd seen for 40 years, all crippled and mangled up over here. Can I get some money? shaking his cup. 
And now he's jumping and dancing and leaping on the Temple Mount for joy. I'm just saying. 44 and 45. Now all who believed were together. He just underlined that in your Bible and had all things in common. They were together. Look, I don't care if you don't want to be together with us, fine. Go someplace else and but be together with a group of like-minded believers. I don't think everybody has to come to this church. I wish everybody would. <laughs> but no, but there has to be, you got to be together. Underline that. It was the love of God, it was the agape love of God that brought them about and unified their hearts. Hearts that had been changed by the gospel. Hearts and minds that had been transformed as Romans speaks of. And the world is constantly pitting us against one another. This, this corrupt perf generation, this perverse generation is always pitting you and I against each other. Always bringing attention to the things that separate us while faith in Christ brings us together and we begin to notice that we all face the same common struggles. Who are you listening to, man? Are you listening to a dying, reckless world that's grasping for whatever it has? Or are you listening to the words of everlasting life? They sold their possessions, their goods, and they divided them among themselves. Listen, the only thing that was being divided here was what they had. Now I want to start by saying this legislation to do this here, to, to sell everything and, and give it to the poor, was not legislation that came down from the apostles. You'll never find that in scripture where Peter stood up and said, now listen, this is what we're going to do. We're going to act like a cult here and we're going to get a big pot and everybody sell everything you own. Yeah, the, you know, the 74 Datsun that you have and the, and, the, and the 2013 Mercedes you have, it doesn't matter. I want it all in this pot and then, then I'm going to just, the apostles will, will just, that's how a cult starts, okay? That's not what happened here. The Spirit of God moved it upon them hearts because they had all things in common and they began to care about one another to such an extreme that you're willing to sell what you have and downsize your lifestyle to meet the needs of those that have genuine needs. That was a, just a genuine move of God, just a genuine move of the Spirit. That's what we have here. In fact, the baptizer, John the baptizer in Luke 3, he, people were coming out to be baptized. It started with Pharisees, then tax collectors, and then some soldiers in the passage. And they'd be, but every single group that came out were asking, well, what next? Like, what do I need to do now? They're all wet. And they're like, what now? You know, right? And he, and he, and he, says, he says to one group, he says this. He says, uh, it's on the screen. Uh, Luke 3, um, verse 11. He who has two tunics, John the Baptist says, give to him who has none. And he who has food, let him do likewise. Right? The early church was so affected and so in love with Jesus that they became so in love with their brothers and sisters. And it wasn't a matter of status. They were filled with agape love. And instead of being like this, they were like this. And it wasn't, it wasn't, it was a move of the spirit. It was not uh, a law from the church, right? It wasn't like the Mormon church. There was nobody going around checking. Okay, so you make 80,000 a year. Okay, so I, you're supposed to give that. And you make, you make uh, 14,000 a year. You need to get a better job. We'll be praying for that. And, uh, <laughs> and you need to be giving three bucks a week. And I'm just joking. I'm messing around. So... <laughs> The point is, is that, is that when the God's spirit moves, they just wanted to get what they had and they wanted to get it into the hands of God in a holy, righteous way and see the needs of those around them being met. And it, it was powerful. It was just crazy awesome, right? Forty-six and forty-seven. So they continued daily. Listen. So they continued steadfastly. Now it says they continued daily 
The idea is, guys, they were doing this on a daily basis. It wasn't just Sunday morning. They weren't Sunday morning disciples or Christians. They were, they were daily disciples, and they were in one accord in the temple. Breaking of bread again from house to house. This is communion. You're communing with God through, through holy communion, and you're communing. You're sharing a meal. They're doing life together. This is so powerful from house to house. And look at this. Wouldn't you like to be a part of this group? And they ate their food with gladness and simplicity of heart. Come on, man. We're not like that. I like steak every night of the week, man. And when I don't have it, I'm not happy. <laughs> Come on, man. When was the last time you really were just blessed, just happy with what you got? You weren't, you weren't lusting or coveting that new car or that bigger house or that bigger job or that steak dinner you smell cooking on the neighbor's grill because we all live close enough in Maricopa that you can do that. <laughs> Come on, man. I'm convicted. Wow. That's attractive. That's, the world would look on and go, Wow with simplicity of heart, praising God, regardless of your status, your economical status, no matter what. You ever seen a happy guy walk into work? I don't, I haven't ever seen a happy guy walk into work. I usually stop and pick, if they're going to work, the only guy, I'm, I'm not big on picking people up, but I'll tell you what, if I see a guy with some tools over his shoulder or carrying a bucket of tools, I'm gonna stop and pick that joker up. That's the person I'm going to pick up, or gal. If, you're, if I know you're going to work, if you're wearing your Taco Bell uniform, I want to encourage that, all right? Right? Praising God. Look at this, in having favor with all people. You know, sometimes you're not going to find favor. Jesus said, you're going to have persecution. You're going to have struggle. They're going to come against you. But you know what? There are going to be times when, you know what, you're going to find favor too. Look for those opportunities when, when you find favor with your neighbor. And use that. Use it as an opportunity to share the gospel. Tell them how great your God is. Let me tell you about what God did for me yesterday, right? Favor with, with all the people. Their Christian experience was a daily, joyful, simple one. So this is God's prescription for church growth and for the, for the Christian to grow. And if we do it, God will do it. Be saved from a perverse generation. 1 Corinthians 1.18 says, For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved... It is the power of God. God's able to save on a daily basis. He's able, he's able. And, and I think that if we look at this and, and I go, you know, I need to pray. And I will then start praying. If I can share a lot of people in closing, uh, a lot of people ask, well, pastor, what did you leave the conference with this week? You know, what did God do in your life this week? And there's a lot of things taught, but I'll, I'll tell you what was, I was affected by, my prayer life. And don't think that I've been prayerless. No, but, but I'm always constantly, I mean, throwing them up there. And, and it, it almost becomes part of the job. Early this morning before first service, there was a gal that came in. She was dropping off her boxes and she, she was getting her walk out. And she says, oh, just stay back. You know, for me and there's some others standing there. And she says, um, I'm, I'm feeling sick, you know. And I said, whoa, 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 get back over here. You know, I'm not going to let you leave without praying for you. So we prayed over it, and she boogied on out of there. Praise God, she came, she dropped off her shoebox, and she, and she got, but I don't want to leave her without her praying. But this is the thing, constantly throwing prayers up. And I was challenged. I was personally challenged because, because sometimes, it's not that I, I have a cold heart. or It's not that. It's just that I want my prayers to be more purposeful you know, more direct. I, I want my prayers to be more led of the Spirit. And so what I chose to do every morning I was there, I, the only place I could find at the hotel where no one was at in the morning early, um, 
was out by the pool. And so I go take my card and open there and just get out there and begin to pray. And, and I was amazed, blown away, and I shouldn't be, at how God's spirit led me in prayer. How I, it wasn't like I was just praying the things that come to my mind, but but truly led by God in my prayer time. It was so powerful. It was so refreshing. I, I just, I'm kind of addicted, to be honest with you. Um, and, uh, and so I just feel like there's some ways where um, my head was just screwed on straight. And, and sometimes we need to get our head screwed on straight, right? And this is a, one of those passages. It should convict us and screw our head on straight and say, well, God, what are you doing with me? You know, are these four basic principles of the faith, are they, are they seen in my church and, and are they seen in whatever I'm doing for you, ministry-wise or serving? Is it seen in my life and my character as a disciple, a follower of you? Are these things evident in my life? And if not, well then, you know, and you might even be doing these things, as I said, and, then, and go, hey, God's calling you to go deeper. Or maybe it's just kind of, you've started going through the motions and, and you know, Maybe God needs a light of fire under that. Amen. Lord, I just thank you for uh, this morning and your word. And, and Lord, the, as I look down as a minister, I see that you added to the church daily. So these are daily following you, hot on your heels, as disciples, and you are daily adding to the church those who are being saved. Disciples being made. Followers of Jesus. Going against the current of the culture and perverse generation. Standing for righteousness and truth. And, and we saw miraculous signs and wonders being done in this church. The earliest of church. Lord, I, I don't, I don't want to be the church like Corinth where, where the Apostle Paul has to kick us in the butt. Lord, we want to be hot on your heels. This morning, where there's not oneness and, and oneness of mind and spirit, God, would you do that? Whether there's brothers and sisters here that are struggling in their relationship one with another, or even it's a marriage. I pray for that. We've surrendered our lives to the same Jesus. That should say something. That should reveal something. Lord, help us to trust you with, with our lives. To lean not on our own understanding, but acknowledge you in, in the ways that we go. Are we going your way or are we going our own way? In Jesus' name, amen. Now let's all stand. This morning, Maybe you've never made a public profession of faith in Jesus. Or maybe you just want to come forward and, and, and just say the sinner's prayer with Doug or myself or Cy. Come forward and do that. If you've got something going on in your life where you need prayer, come forward. We want to pray with you. We serve a mighty God, and there's nothing special about us except for this is a place where ministry happens right here. And, and I don't want you to leave and not be ministered to. This In Jesus' name. As I searched the world, but it couldn't fill me. Man's empty praise, treasures of faith. I
and nothing's better than God. Well, we have been face up in worship of the King of glory. We've been in his holy word. Now let's step forward in living. Amen? Amen. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. Let's go with God, church. God bless you guys.